In this video, I'm going to show you a simple way of creating a map of one or more sites, features, or artifacts for a report, presentation, or publication in Google Earth Pro. Google Earth Pro is relatively easy to use compared to specialized GIS software and has the advantage that it is free to download so anyone with a computer can use it. When you first open it, it looks like this. In the main part of the window, you will see the planet Earth. You can move around the planet by clicking and dragging with your mouse. You can also use the compass, located at the top right of the screen, to change your orientation. You can zoom in and out using the scroll wheel on your mouse or the bar on the side menu. You can also use the plus or minus buttons and the plus or minus buttons on your computer keyboard to zoom in and out. But if you are looking to map an archaeological site, feature, or artifact, you probably have a good idea of where it is. So the easiest way of navigating is to go to the search bar at the top left of the screen and type in its location. On this side panel, you will see a number of different windows. You have the search bar, places, which is where any content you create or load will appear, and layers, which is where you can turn on and off included content like roads, borders and labels, and other things you might want to include in your map to help readers or viewers understand the location and orient themselves. Some of these, like borders and labels, have drop-down menus that allow you to select whether you would like, for example, just labels or just borders. I am going to keep all of these turned off for now and navigate to today's example site, which is Stonehenge. Because Stonehenge is quite iconic, I can actually just type in its name and Google Earth will find the location. You can see now I am at Stonehenge and a point marker is over the stone circle. Stonehenge also appears in the search results on the left. I can also find Stonehenge by typing in the coordinates using either decimal degrees or degrees, minutes, seconds. The decimal degrees for Stonehenge are 51.178887 north comma 1.826301 west because it is west of Greenwich, London. I will hit search and you can see again I am at Stonehenge. If I pan away a second time I can type the coordinates for Stonehenge using degrees, minutes, seconds like this. 51 degrees, space, 10 minutes, indicated by a single apostrophe, 43.93 seconds, using the double quotation mark to denote seconds, north, comma, 1 degree, 49 minutes, 34.43 seconds west, because again, it's west of London. Hit search, or enter, also called return, and once again, we are at Stonehenge. I can save this pin in my places by right-clicking on it in the search results and selecting Save to My Places. I can also drop a pin in the location by using the first button on the toolbar at the top that says Add Placemark. And it will place a placemark in the center of my screen, wherever that is. At the same time, this new window will appear that allows me to change the name of the placemark, currently untitled placemark, 
to something more meaningful, like a site name, site number, a feature number, or an artifact number. In this case, I'm going to type Stonehenge and hit OK. I don't need two place marks on this, so I'm going to select the top one listed under Places, right click on it, and press Delete to remove the pin. You can still see the coordinates next to the pin. This is because they are still located in the search results window. To clear those, I will press the X, and you can see they are removed. Now, I might want to adjust the precise location of the pin. Particularly if I'm doing something like this, where I've just typed in the name or address of the site. Maybe it's not quite centered. So what I can do is right click and go to properties. You will see this window appear again, and this will allow me to drag and drop the pin around to wherever I would like. In this case, I'm going to center it there. I can then use this button here, the yellow push pin, to change the symbol used to denote my site. When you click on it, you get this menu with a number of preloaded icons. It is possible to add a custom icon, but for now we will stick with the preloaded icons. As a rule, it is best to avoid symbols that are strongly associated with certain things, like P for parking, H for hospital, or an airplane to denote an airport. Otherwise, there is no hard and fast rule for which symbols you should use to denote an archaeological site or feature. But it is probably best to pick something generic like these dots here, or this square, or maybe one of these pins here. I'm going to use this dot. At the top, you can see I can adjust the color of the dot, the scale, and its opacity. If I click OK, you can see that I can also adjust that in this tab here, style and color, the color, the scale, and the opacity again. But in this tab, I can also change the label color. Maybe I want to make it yellow. I will keep it white. And I will reduce the size of the icon. If I click OK, you can see that it has saved the changes that I made. Now you should know how to map your sites, features, or artifacts using point symbols. To actually produce the map image that can be placed in a report, presentation, or publication, I will go to File, Save, Save Image. This will make various boxes appear that weren't there before, and a scale and north arrow will appear. By clicking here, I can give my map a title and a description, or write my name. There is an automatically generated legend that I can click on to edit. If I'd had more than one element, I would be able to turn them on and off in this window. But here it's just the one, so I will keep it as is and close the window. If I don't want to keep all of these map elements, I can go to Map Options and turn them on and off. I will remove the title and description. Here, I can also change the background image. Right now, it is full color. I can choose a desaturated color base or a black and white background which is useful if you are dealing with a publication that only prints black and white images. I will go back to full color, and then I will click anywhere outside of the menu to close it. The next button over has resolution, and this is where I can set the resolution of the final image to whatever specifications are required for my presentation, report, or publication. Lastly, I will click Save Image. 
the save window will automatically open to your last saved location, which in my case is the My Documents folder on my computer and a folder I created called Google Earth Pro Images. I will give the file a name, in this case Stonehenge, and save it as a JPEG. Unfortunately, you can see there is no option to change that. If you do need a different image format, for example, a TIFF, the best thing to do is open it in another program, even something as simple as Paint, and save as. I will hit Save. Now, if I navigate to that folder, I can see the image file and I can open it up. This JPEG image is now ready to be included in my report, presentation, or publication. If I want to save the actual data that I've entered, all the different points, so that I can add to them or edit them in the future, or load them up again to create a different map, what I can do is go to File, Save, Save place as. This will save the points I have plotted as a KMZ file, which is a Google Earth file. If I hit save and go to the same folder, I would see the KMZ file. This is useful both if you need to work with the data again and for sharing with colleagues. You can email the KMZ file like any other attachment. To open the files, your colleagues can go to File, Open, and navigate to where they saved the KMZ, or double-click on the file directly. This is a great way to share spatial data generally, because Google Earth Pro is free to download and easy to use. It does not require that your colleagues have specialized GIS knowledge. Now you should know how to produce a basic map with points. In the next video, I will show you how to use polygons and lines to draw plans of sites or features.